you'll find, strangely enough, that when you talk to attorneys, they don't know law. Even magistrates don't really know law. They know a little bit. It's not until you start getting to superior court judges and some of the district courts, they know stuff. Federal judges absolutely know. Yeah, but, in fact, I've heard a lot of phone calls where people have talked about how federal judges are so hard and difficult to deal with. And most of my experiences is that federal judges are very, very easy to deal with because they know law. I've been from some judges, man, and the guy, he tried being hardcore with me for one round. Then after that, he was cool. Yeah, you know what? I, I know that you guys are right because I had written a federal judge in uh, the Northern District of Indiana when I had filed I had a, a file with federal lien against the state and the cops and everything. That's a long story. But the the uh, the judge actually wrote me a letter back and wrote my name in upper and lower case, addressing me properly. But what he did was he wrapped the court letter with a white blank letter with my name like that on it. So I was pretty impressed by that. That's the first time I ever saw anything like that. I got a letter just like that one. Same thing. What you're dealing with when you're dealing with these state courts or these county courts, man, is you're dealing with Jimmy who grew up with Johnny, who hung out with Susie, who dated Timmy's sisters, uh, Tammy, you know. They all know each other. All their pensions are tied in together. They go fishing together. They go to church. They go to Rutan. They do all these things together. And they don't, you know, it's all about prestige and being the big guy on the block. And then they have two, you know, somebody or the GED comes in and says, uh, no, <laughs> you can't do that. You know, and they do it in a way that's completely lawful. And then suddenly they've got to, you know, like JC was talking about, pitting them against one another. And scoffers can say whatever they wish. But uh, we're seeing it firsthand. I mean, you know, you've got hurdles you got to get over. And writing properly is a way to absolutely lock them in. And another thing is that if you do not write properly, you're not even in the door. You're, you're not getting anywhere. If you, if you cannot do proper paperwork, they will run over you 100% of the time. Because they know you don't know. And here's the funny part. The paperwork's only like 5% of it. I mean, look how much time we've been on the phone, an hour and 40 minutes, dealing with a simple piece of paper that didn't even really have that much stuff on it. And that's how much time and energy it takes to do something that only counts for 5% of what we're doing. Because there's so much more. There's attitude, the look in your eye, the way you carry yourself, the way you think, the way you believe, the way you act, the way you speak, the tone in your voice, when you speak, when you don't speak. I mean, there's so many factors in this. But guys, if you're fake, you're not going to make it. Yeah, I mean, it's like uh, the shaman and I talk about you can just write three words and you've gotten rid of their jurisdiction, you've gotten rid of their presumptions, you've gotten rid of so many things with three words, and that is I am man or I am woman. But once you write those words down, it's not good enough. You have to go in there and actually be it. Otherwise, they're going to say, oh, we got an imposter here. And you can try two other words when you go in. Says who? So there's five words that just decimate the entire legal system. I am man, says who? Well, we're charging you with this, 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 that, and that. And you just write on a piece of paper, says who? I mean, I'm being a little joking around, but essentially it's who? Who, who says I do wrong, right? Less I mean, is more. Yeah, that's why, like, on the other document where it's talking about uh, the notice appearance, not putting the parties in shows whoever's sitting up on the bench that day that you know what you're talking about and it might show them they might be kind of questioning it and thinking you might know it better than they do and it's a lot of these really little proper things um i was looking over a document for somebody the other day and they had three words in a row and one of them was capitalized and i asked them why they capitalized that particular word the, the correct way is, is to have all of those words capitalized because you'd be making them all proper nouns or having none of them capitalized, but that wouldn't be as correct. But, you know, just small little things like that makes a big difference. And you can't imagine, well, yeah, you can. I mean, I guess everybody can, but it's just a, a, a phrase. But, like, it's so rewarding 
and cool. Like I remember back in the day when I'd get a court document, it would have a certain impact on me in a certain way, you know. Now I get one and it's like within the first sentence, you know what's going on. Sometimes just, I mean, just the way they stylize the, the wordings of the, the actual court it's coming from. <clears throat> it's really amazing the doors it opens up to learn this English stuff. Um, when you start actually understanding why something works and then the how to respond, all the fear just leaves because you realize they're not talking to the, I mean, everybody knows intellectually, okay, okay, it's a straw man, the all cap man, okay, I know. I know, and then you listen to countless stories of people going into court, and for some reason, and they stand in front of the judge, suddenly the straw man becomes very real, and they start using words like, yes, sir, I understand, you know, and they're just writing things on paper just to write them, but, the, you know, the, they know if you know what you're writing or not. Just well, like I you would, would, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, no. I would say the most dangerous word to use in a courtroom is want and need. Because people and people really got to start, and even for myself, in the middle of just an average conversation, I might use those words not thinking about it, but I really consciously always try and use wish and require. And whenever I'm going in there and talking to them, you know, like I am so focused on what I'm saying that I will always use wish and require. And by the time I leave, they are using wish and require. I mean, it's something to practice documents and then share them with one another, like put app, you know, take people you work with, put um, WhatsApp groups together and uh, critique them, you know, get somebody in the group who does know how to write and get them to critique and then learn and practice in front of a mirror. Like when you're going, you know, practice, go sit in the court for two, three, four hours, you know, once a week, once every couple of weeks, just go sit through courtrooms, watch the process. And you, what you'll find are, and there's some really systematic things that they do, and they do them every time, especially if somebody's making a plea. If somebody's copping a plea, you just there's usually about four things the judge will say, and uh, it's pretty intriguing because they're building a little force field for themselves at the end of that. And if you just sit and listen to it, they do it almost every single time. Matter of fact, I've never not heard them do it. Yeah, they they always do it even when they're pulling you into a case. And they do these things because of those basically a force field. And if people don't understand how to go in there and, um, you know, like uh, we had the example of notice of appearance or notice of pure appearance, however way you wish to just say it. But a very common trick that the other side uses is they will have a notice of appearance or a motion of appearance um, because an attorney has to do a notice of appearance when he's representing a client. And in fact, whenever you sue an attorney, and this is hilarious, whenever you sue an attorney, the attorney will always do a notice of appearance notifying you that the esquire is going to represent the man, the actual individual that you're suing. So, but I've been in a lot of situations where they have a notice of appearance written up for, uh, you know, whoever's getting sued, the defendant, if they wish to call them that, and they just got to get them to sign it, and they say, if you don't sign this, you can't appear in the case. Great. <laughs> I didn't wish to appear in the case anyways. Right, You're coming thanks. after me. <laughs> I'll see you hey. later. I'm going to play devil's advocate since most people aren't speaking up. What do you what do you say to the person who says only ghosts appear? You can't ever appear in court. How would you how would you address that, JC? I don't appear in court. I appear at court. I appear before the court. The court hasn't quite caught up with me yet. Yeah, maybe my physical presence is within the four courthouse walls, you know, within those boundary limits. But I appear at the court. I appear before the court because I'm making a special appearance. I'm a man. A man cannot appear in a state court. Only persons can. But if you're in state, you have status, and you're a statistic, and you're worshiping statutes, and you're dead. That's why a man can't ever appear in a court. Not in a state court, excuse me. A man can only appear in a court of law. And the whole reason 
<clears throat> that man entrusts the state with the courts of law is because most of the business is between corporations. Like most of the business going on in the courthouse is literally between corporations. The really why, big business. That's why it's admiralty, and that's what we talked about on Saturday, that that's all the mystery Babylon. It's that commercial, mercantile, trademark, all those things are, you know, bridged into and built into that little world, and that's why you have the priest and the cleric or the clerk, the clergy, sentence, the penance, all those things. You know, Denominations of currency. <laughs> I have conviction in the defendant. I have conviction in Christ. I got a question that popped up, and it was basically someone asking for me to explain the difference between parentheses and brackets. And unlike, uh, you know, colons and semicolons and commas, uh, this difference is actually pretty easy. So the parentheses is anything that you didn't author, you didn't give it authority, but you're referencing it in your document, in your paperwork. Brackets are, it's completely not yours. It's not even there. It's just, it's written for the reader's eyes only, like only the one that I'm sending this to, no one else. And of course, everyone's going to see what's in the brackets, but that's basically the difference is that what's in parentheses is there. It's just not authored by you. What's in brackets is not even there. It's well, not very, huh? and, and parentheses are a parenthetical thought, too, They're like a, like a qualifying word, like the S can be a qualifying like when you put something in parentheses. Yeah, or like uh, you could put examples in parentheses. Like you could make a statement of something and then, you know, put in parentheses examples. Yeah, like or, chocolate, Hershey's would be the parenthetical thought, a descriptive or qualifying word, right? Yeah. So, and, um, you know, the brackets is really just, it's, it's not there. And I'm sure a lot of listeners have heard of the CF and comparing it to something else. And I've gotten to the point where I try not to do that. If I absolutely have to, if I CF something, it's going to go in a red box because it's not part of my document at all. Hey, and when you learn this stuff too, like an example, like when you get a court document, most of the time you will find that the court is in all caps. The name is in all caps, defendants all caps, the prosecutor will be in all caps. I mean, all these things and the order will be written in all caps. Um, further ordered often is written in, you know, these things are not on the page. So basically they're not really given an order. There is no, I mean, they really do tell you the truth. They're just not honest. I mean, they really do tell you a lot of what's going on. And when you understand the English language, when you know what the real $100 looks like, it's easy to spot the counterfeits, and you, it's like, oh, this isn't talking to me. This isn't for me. So then you know how to respond to it. So um, the IE, the IE is in effect, okay? EG is example given. Um, and these are just, uh, you know, short punctuations, abbreviations of things. But these uh, short abbreviations are very, very important. Because if you're using them properly, and most importantly, if you're using them improperly, then they know that you're not as well educated as maybe they thought you were. I mean, it's a war of words, man. And they're they're excellent. They're excellent at it. The the higher up these judges get, man, they are just they're really really brilliant at this stuff. And they practice it every day. Yeah, I mean, they have yeah they have a leg up on us. That's what they do. Most of us are running around as making spontaneous utterances and broken sentence fragments. So no other hey, questions? Thomas. Yeah, I got one for you. Uh, if it's in all caps, the order's in all caps, and we take it as not being on the page or it's not there, what are the consequences if you ignore it? You can't ignore it. This is where you've got to know how to be man. You've got to know how to respond without responding. And I know that sounds like some tie-dyed shirt, acid-tripping statement, but it's absolutely true. You can answer a question that you wish they had asked you instead of the one they did or what they wrote. Like, just like a lot of people, I mean, you got, you're going to go to court, man. 
most of the time, you got to go. People, you just not getting out of it. Um, hey, can so I come knowing, in here? Yeah. How about it? I, I believe uh, what he was asking was uh, when you get an order against you and you know that it's not effective, how do you go go about, like, making that recognized? Was that the question, like, making it recognized that it's not effective? Well, I guess that would be the uh, the desired end point because if it's in all caps and we know it's it's not there, it's invisible. How do we make them admit that it's not visible, or how do we? Well, just... here here here's the thing is that, and this goes right back to a, a representation of persons. And if you are representing the person, you know, if you are a person in the court, then you're representing the person, and that's absolutely enforceable you have to inform them that you're not the person. You have to do it appropriately, and then you stay completely in law. Because once you represent the person, the representation of that person is a fiction of the law, and they're the authority that gives that fiction any life. So they can write whatever they wish for that fiction. You have to make sure, and this is why it is imperative to never, ever, ever step into that fiction. And that's where I was kind of going. I was just doing my little paintbrush thing, example, answer the without answering. So you've got to know how to be man and not respond as the person. That's kind of where I was going, but you already said it, so it's cool. But yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're a person, obviously it doesn't matter. Whatever they're doing, they're doing. But if you know how to inform them of standing and you know how to write, then basically what you're telling them is you know that that's not a – that's not an order, and it has nothing to do with you. Yeah, and if you are, like, if you appear before the court as man, even if they get an order against you, all you <laughs> got to do is start challenging the qualifications because it's not legitimate. Like, I have seen a fair amount of orders go in against people, and the high clerk will never sign up. So they what have you do to be the, duly qualified. Yeah, what what would you do if the high clerk didn't sign an order and they were trying to effect it on you? Like they were trying to execute it on you. What would you do? Well, if it's not signed, I mean, it's like giving me a check that's not signed. I'm not going to cash it. So why should I adhere to anything if it's not signed? Because you have to take care of it. You have to you, do You have something. to put something on the record, man. Because the cop, the cop, that's on the street, he don't know anything about this. All he sees is a little, little mark on a piece of paper that says judgment and order on it. That's all the cop sees, okay? You have to point it out to them. If they don't sign it, you have to put that into the case and say, hey, you didn't sign this. You have to make that known. You declare yeah. it, basically. Like, if you just ignore it, dude, that's called acquiescence. You're just accepting it. Like, when you have a duty to respond, you can't ignore it. That's what I'm saying. You have to respond, but you don't start arguing. When I'm saying answer it without answering it, you don't start arguing with them. You don't start de defending that you're not this or you're not. You don't do that. You just say, hey, did you know this thing wasn't signed? Now you brought it to their attention. A lawful order must be signed, right? So you just called them out. And you're talking now about they deal with that. Put that in a notice, not just say it verbally, but put it in a notice. Yeah, everything has to be in writing, brother. Yeah, everything okay. that you say verbally has to be in writing. In fact, I have, uh, when I first learned this, I was sitting in front of somebody, and they said that they couldn't do anything because nothing appeared before them. Like, they didn't, there wasn't a problem that appeared that they could do anything about. And I was like, oh, my God. And I get a legal pad and a pen. I write some stuff down. I go, now, now is there a problem that appears that you can do something about? And he just looked at me and smiled and said, okay, we can do I mean, this. You guys should have heard some of the conversations that were had with a clerk. And they are so careful when they know. Uh, they are so careful, almost to the point of dropping hints. Because they can, they don't wish to be liable, and they know when you're. It's like you may not see the plane, but you hear it over you. You hear it overhead, and you start looking. So you know they're almost over the target. You know that plane's coming, and they are definitely concerned with that. And we we've experienced that on numerous occasions. 
So everything, everything is always how you respond, and that's kind of why we're doing this letter thing or this document thing so you yeah, guys can start understanding how to respond to these things. Well, and, and that actually might not be the best way to say it because it's, instead of reacting to what they're doing to you, you got to get them reacting to what you're doing to them. They, they got to be reacting to it. Because if they're just sending things and you're reacting to what they're sending, then you're one or two steps behind the game. You know, like one one of the things, and this is what I love about a legal society, is that they always build the case against themselves. So you always wish to be before the court, you know, always running before the court until the very end, and then you come up from behind and push it down, you know. It's very interesting stuff, but you got to know what you're doing. Because just like those judges can sit up there on that bench and get you into contract law, it's an open court. You can do it to them, too. Yeah, you're allowed to make baskets, not just them. You know, if you're going to hit tennis balls over on this side of the court, you better be ready for them to come back at you. I guess you're right, though. I mean, telling them about the proactive thing, because really, even if – even if you're acting properly and you're and you're not in their jurisdiction, if you only react, you're technically kind of in a defensive posture. I actually saw somebody write that on a statement in a debate that I was having, and you uh, know, in, in one one respect, they're they're accurate because you're just reacting, or or you know, that's what defendants do. Somebody comes and you defend. So yeah, you've got to go on the uh, offense. Are there? Uh... Any more questions? I have a question for uh, either of you guys or both of you guys. I was just wondering if you've done anything like an, an administrative capacity using a uh, a notary to stop the state. Uh, uh, absolutely. Like an injunction I mean, or you know something yeah, like that. We're definitely not saying that we never use any type of administrative process. Um, there's a time and a place for that. So, but for the most part, you know this. I believe that this show is basically sticking to law and how to actually use law and get results. But maybe at some point in time we can have an administrative, like I was talking about uh, starting the administrative process, I believe with you earlier. And that's basically when you start the administrative process of, hey, here's the problem. How do we solve this problem? Because just like the shaman said earlier, like, court is the absolute last place that you should have to go, okay? So before you ever go to court, you always got to say, hey, you're on my toes. Will you get off my toes? Um, In your particular case, it might seem like you're going to have to write to multiple different people and say, hey, I don't know who's on my toes, but I believe you could be involved. I don't know if it's you or if it's the sheriff or if it's the clerk or if it's the magi. I don't know who it is, but somebody's definitely on my toes. Can you guys figure it out? Yeah, whether it's your controversy or theirs, try to remove it. Maybe they're standing on your toe. Maybe you're standing on theirs. Just say, look, you know, I wish to, you know, I wish to settle any matter of controversy immediately. Once you say that, you know, it's like if they just barrel through and go to court, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm trying to sell this in private, man. And because of that, you always have to do the same to them, and that that is one administrative process, is you writing three documents saying, hey, you know, this is what's going on. What can we do about it? Right. Well, that's what my next move was actually going to be before I decided to to basically turn towards the common law again. I was going to do an administrative process, but I was – sticking to the legalese garbage, which I'm not anymore. Yeah, well, and don't get me wrong. Even when we do administrative processes, we write it out in English law. And generally, we try to jump back out. We usually just use the administrative process to accomplish a goal. But, but, you know, I mean, there's, there's a place for everything. There's a time for everything. This is why there were administrative courts way back when. Um, I believe the shaman and I are working on something, some type of history lesson that's going to talk about what the common law was before the revolution and what the common law was after the Revolutionary War. 
because before the Revolutionary War, it was tyrannical, and basically the you know, government, the central government of England was taking away the right of man to access the common law and the courts, and everybody knows about William Penn, you know, and jury nullification, or I would at least presume most people listening know about that case and the jury nullification that was a result of that case. Um, you know, most people growing up in the United States are taught in history lessons, social studies, about the shot that was heard around the world. And both of those things are directly because there was no law uh, that the government of uh, this region of the world had become lawless. And after the society gained the supposed freedom, you know, they were given vast freedoms and it was recognized in open courts. So I think that's a pretty interesting part of history to go over and it happened within a generation. And uh, if you go to redressfordummies.org on the common law shamanism page, you're going to find a bunch of stuff from a guy called the informer. It's under patriotism and other BS and also any of the informer stuff or James Montgomery stuff. That is the, uh, some of the best teachings on the law pre-revolution and post.